Hello, dear friends. We are going to take a look at the memoirs of a German non-commissioned officer, Arthur Kruger. He was 22 years old at the moment of the beginning of the invasion into the Soviet Union. He served in the 60th Motorized Infantry Division of the Wehrmacht. His memoirs describe the brutal Russian winter of 1941, the defensive battles in Ukraine, the battle for Kharkov, and the battle for Stalingrad. Something I liked about these memoirs is that he pays special attention in them to the German soldiers' struggle against the cruel winter cold in Russia. These were indeed inhumane circumstances, and yet they still had to fight. And now, let's focus on his memoirs. I was born on June 12, 1920, in the free city of Danzig. Since the moment of formation of our unit in June 1939, and up to the time of its fall in Stalingrad, I joined him in the combat operations. Our Eberhardt unit, formed in Danzig and engaged in the war in Poland, was later assigned to the Grossborn Military Training Ground in Pomern for reorganization. We, two regiments of the Danzig Police, became infantry regiments number 243 and 244. Our third, assigned to us, became regiment number 92 from Pomerania. There, they taught us how to conduct combat operations and how to storm fortified positions. In 1941, there was talk that we would be moved from Greece to Austria and from there to the English Channel Coast to invade England. By the time we arrived in Austria, we were informed, the invasion is cancelled, the Russians are pulling together massive forces in the border areas and preparing for an aggression against Germany. It was June 1941. They sent us to the Eastern Front. At the end of June, being part of the second wave, we joined the offensive against the Russians and broke through their starting lines. A completely different war broke out for us. We witnessed the Russian tanks as big as a house for a whole family, along with the tractor and squashed them like toys. This tank was known as Stalin's tank. Later, the T-34s came along as well. I never saw the monster tank again. The Russians were firing at our unarmed orderlies and their vehicles, which was recognizable from a distance. It was nearly impossible to take out our wounded and killed comrades. A group from our reconnaissance unit was caught in an ambush by the Russians. After a counterattack, we found our wounded comrades, who were unable to pull back, stabbed with their own bayonets. The order from Stalin stated, Kill the Germans. Strike them to death, no matter where they are. Death to the German invaders. It was an order to kill. The response order from Hitler was, To kill is more important than to capture. We had faced at least some humanity when fighting the Polish, the French, and the British but there was no humanity here. With the battles, we were making good progress. With heavy losses, we took Kiev, Poltava, Taganrog, Mariupol, and Rostov. The winter came. The Russian winter came too soon. We were exhausted. Rostov was the gateway to the Caucasus. The Russians counterattacked us with large forces in order to take Rostov again. We left Rostov and took the winter positions of 1941 to 1942 on the Meuse River. I will never forget the things we experienced there. It would be a hard thing to remember about it. Muse Frontier, December 1941 At night, when there was a heavy blizzard, we were instructed to take up positions. The frost hardened the ground to stone. The sappers had been blowing it up with explosives for two days in a row in order to build a shelter with a wooden roof for our 18-man unit. I took up a position in front of it with my two heavy machine guns. The temperature dropped below negative 40. The blizzard was so bad that nothing could be seen within a meter. Our eyelids were getting frozen. To be able to hear better, as we could not see anything, we set up a forward guard post in front of our position and changed shifts every half hour. It was not possible to stay longer than that. We could get frozen to death. In our motorized units, we all had greatcoats. In winter, when we were sitting in trucks on the march, we put them on over all our ammunition. We asked for greatcoats to be delivered to our positions so that we could wear them for a four-hour guard duty near a heavy machine gun. By the time we were shoveling snow from one side of the position, the other side was already snowed in. This way, we were saving ourselves from the cold. We had no food for whole days. There were no supplies at all. The trucks had no antifreeze, and the engine oil was frozen. No engine would start. Even in the locomotives, the glycentine was frozen solid. We were eating the rest of our provisions. Only after three days the supplies came, a soup with corn kernels frozen in ice and horse meat. 
It was the meat of the horses that, unable to bear the strain of the snow, had fallen. There were five tins of canned sausage and two bread loaves for eighteen people. It's all frozen stone, but the supply improved soon. Every ten days we were rotated and sent to the second echelon for rest. Here, in Ukrainian houses, we were treated with friendliness, sometimes as if we were their own children. The Ukrainians kept us warm and treated our frostbite. We felt as if we were at home here. In ten days we were again sent to the front line. The ferocious cold hit us in the face. Overcoming blizzards and snow, we struggled to reach our positions. Many comrades with frostbite of the second and third grade were dismissed. The war ended for them. For Christmas, each of us was given half a loaf of bread and a can of blood sausage with cigarettes. We never had enough cigarettes. It lasted all winter. At nights, hot meals were delivered, but when we got the food, it was already covered with a crust of ice on top. We lay in our hole in the ground, closely huddled together, and in that way, we warmed ourselves. At the guard change, we first had to dig ourselves out of the snow. We could not touch the barrels or any other metal parts of weapons and objects barehanded and without gloves, because otherwise our hands would get frozen to them. The Russians, notwithstanding their warm winter uniforms, lived not much better. They did not trouble us, except once, when the visibility was better. They came to attack us with the forces of one company. They were led in the attack by a commissar with a pistol in his hand. Putting their hands in their pockets and with their rifles slung over their shoulders, they came under our machine gun fire. Those who survived moved back to their positions. The cruel winter forced enemies and friends to stand idle. Only a handful of us survived that cruel winter. We had no winter uniforms. All we had was the usual winter uniforms that soldiers used to wear in the homeland. We did not even have any winter camouflage for hiding. The supply gradually improved, and then the spring thaw came. People who hoped it would get better were wrong. The trucks got stuck in the mud and never drove. The shift at our positions was always at night. To the second line, and our rest area was about five or even ten kilometers. It was dark at night, no matter what you looked at. It was hard to find one's bearings. Sometimes groups of soldiers were walking around in circles and returning to the front line. I was always in the rear of the units with my heavy weapons. Non-commissioned officer Kruger turned from the head of the column to its tail, and then again returned to the head. The soldiers were singing in spite of their exhaustion. Our officer has lost his aim again. At that time, I used to lead them, and as a rule, I always led them correctly, occasionally turning 500 meters to the left from the village. People say that all people drift to the right. A left-handed person has a counterweight, so he goes straight, and I'm left-handed. The biggest problem was the muddy ground. The boots popped off and stayed stuck in the mud. It was very tricky to find them again in the dark. We were exhausted. We were tired enough to drink melted water from the ditches. Our casualties by disease and frostbite were very high. We were replaced and sent to rest. During this winter, we were all given an order each. We named it the Order of Frostbite. We were rejoined by our comrades and leave-takers who had recovered. We, young and not married, were not so lucky. We did not get any vacations. And in the close future, we would not get any. Because Danzig had not been bombarded at that time. We were happy to be able to wash ourselves at last, to get rid of lice a bit, and to sleep well at night. The relations with the Ukrainian people were very good. They were a home for us at that time. They were free to voice their opinions again, to go to church and pull out the icons. We were liberators for them from the brutal Stalinism. Sadly, after we moved forward, they were sorely frustrated by the SS forces that came to replace us. They behaved in a way that was not liberator-like. The Battle for Kharkov We got reassigned again. I was put in command of a heavy mortar squad. We were getting ready for our next mission. It didn't take long. It was an operation to surround Kharkov. I guess it was May 1942. After all these years, months and dates are hard to remember. All the days and months were the same for us, who had already been involved in the fighting. We were thinking about something else, and the ones who wrote the diaries were certainly not fighting on the front line. On the Kharkov front, a powerful army fought against us. In the battles, heavy and bloody for both sides, we succeeded in surrounding this army. A growing number of Russians gave themselves up as prisoners. By the thousands, they were passing us with their hands up. It was just hell. Everything that could shoot, stugs, tanks, it was all firing at the surrounded Soviet troops. When we broke in, 
we had to go through hills of corpses and moaning wounded. We were used to the pictures of death, we old soldiers. They told us that by order of Stalin, the general who was in command of this army was flown out of the encirclement by plane. The truth is, we were also told that Stalin's son had been captured. Due to heavy losses, we were running out of strength, and we were again sent to rest and replenishment. A lot of us got the trench fever. It was a kind of malaria. It was terrifying. We were injected with vaccinations and given to swallow quinine pills. For a short time, our division was withdrawn to the reserve. In late June, we were again ready to engage in battle, and after crossing the dawn near Kalak, we again pursued the Russians. The task was to break through the enemy's rear by tanks in order to cut off their forward units. We got too far ahead. The infantry could not keep up behind us. The order came, Hold the position! We were waiting for fuel and infantry. Wherever you looked, you could not see a single house, tree, or bush. Only a few camels, which had not had time to run away, were our companions. The communication with the main units was restored very quickly. We had fuel and food again, and we were heading for Stalingrad. We were amazed that we no longer encountered T-34s, but instead only American trucks and tanks. We had heard that the Americans were providing the Russians with military equipment through Vladivostok. My platoon captured a light-tracked American tractor, and we loaded the heavy parts of our mortars onto it. When our forces began to surround Stalingrad, we, together with the 16th Panzer Division, broke through from the north and reached the Volga. There, we took the so-called northern main positions and beat off any breakthrough attempt. The Battle for Stalingrad We suffered particularly heavy losses in the battles for Kalak and Stalingrad. We usually had 30 to 50 men left in our companies. We kept the front line of the defense in fragments, and we were waiting for a replacement. We approached the Russians as close as it was at all possible. Occasionally, it was no more than 100 meters away, so as not to come under fire from the Soviet rocket mortars. They had a target distance of up to 250 meters, so if they wanted to fire on us, they would have to shoot at their men. They had very good snipers. Movement during daylight hours was suicide. The losses in Stalingrad were beyond all possible limits. Our infantry units were literally bleeding to death. And so, when the replacements arrived, they were badly trained. I had to cover a hole in our defense with my platoon of heavy mortars somehow. At a distance of about 150 meters from the Russians, we took our positions. Most of the officers were young and unexperienced. The main strain was put on the experienced senior Gefreiters and on the non-commissioned officers. We were given drivers and rear and supply personnel. Some of them came back from infirmaries and vacations. They reached our positions with the food carriers. In their minds, they seemed to be still at home. They never heard our warning. Attention, snipers, duck your heads! They did not make it to the attack. So we became superstitious. Those who got on leave will be killed. But we had no reason to worry about it. All the vacations were soon cancelled. During the nights, we dug and built our fortifications like crazy. We dragged the excavated soil back on tents and scattered it in an even layer far behind the defense line. They were bringing food and ammunition to the front line. The infantry was not enough, and so I remained with my ten comrades from the platoon of heavy mortars to cover the hole. We had a minefield in front of us and the Russians behind it. My platoon still had four other Obergefreiters, my old comrades. I had been together with them for a long time. We perfectly adjusted our mortars. We had excellent visibility of the area, so we were able to get the enemy everywhere. The 5th Company command post was on our left, to which I and my mortars were subordinate. To our right were several heavy machine guns from my company. The rifle company had a lot of casualties caused by bullet hits to the head. They had carbines with optics, but because they were not trained enough, they knew nothing about how to use them. I ordered them to throw one of these carbines to me, and I took out a sniper with it. All the time, the Russians were attempting to check the strength of our defenses with short attacks. We literally cut them down with our barrage fire. And afterwards, you could always hear the death screams of the wounded slowly fading away. Three Russians fled to us at my position. I asked, why don't you help your wounded? And they answered, the wounded are considered only those who can carry on fighting. If you leave the battlefield yourself, you will be helped. If you are not able to move, you will be left lying there. A long way behind the Russian trenches, we could constantly hear the clanking of tank tracks at night. We had a feeling that some bad stuff was getting brewed there. And then we heard, the Russians broke through on the Romanian section with large forces. The Italian front was also under pressure. 
At Kalak, the Russians reached the dawn and surrounded us. At the very beginning, we were not too worried. Our division was often surrounded before, but always managed to get out, and then it became worse with ammunition and food. The young twenty-year-old men were dying of hunger exhaustion. We were plagued by typhus and lice. The only ones who got out of this hell were the wounded. The desire was only one, an instant painless death. Some people became self-shooters in order to escape in this way as wounded. The others would go crazy and jump out of their shelters, being immediately shot by snipers. Only the one who had his nerves in order could survive. Some of them retreated to the rear. Probably they thought they would find a way to escape from the cauldron there. Sometimes they were caught and shot, or sent to a penalty unit for demining. I guess it was late November. We heard the clanking of tank tracks. It was way afternoon and there they came. I counted ten T-34s. They rushed over our positions, where, in depth, they were met by our anti-tank artillery. There was a battalion of infantry at a distance behind the tanks. They tried to get in our flank. We let them close for a shot, and then it was hell. Their offensive was crushed under our crossfire. When our tanks and infantry arrived, they helped organize our withdrawal. In late November 1942, during a mortar attack, I was wounded in my left shoulder and head and was taken to the Gumrock Airdrome, to a wounded men's assembly point. There I stayed until the morning to be carried out by plane. I was among the last soldiers of my company who left Stalingrad alive. The rest of my company, which remained in the northern main positions until January, was squashed by the tracks of tanks. Our company commander, Senior Lieutenant Kessler, and 56 non-commissioned officers and privates with him died a so-called hero's death. Those who survived died in Russian captivity. There were only a few rear soldiers from our unit who were taken prisoner, and they returned from it, a senior Feldwebel, a non-commissioned officer of the ammunition service, and two other non-commissioned officers, a physician, and one from the supply service. It would be impossible to describe what was happening in Gumrock. The wounded men were screaming like crazy. All of them wanted to escape, hanging onto the wings and obstructing the planes on takeoff. Those who were seriously wounded had the right to be the first on board. This was not applicable to me. I had given up all hope of being rescued. In the morning mist, one of the Ju-52s ran into a bomb hole. The pilot was expecting a tractor to pull the plane out. I spoke to him. He was a Feldwebel and used to be in the infantry. That's what he told me, that only those who were heavy wounded could be taken. He went back to the airplane and then suddenly returned and asked me if I could fire the machine gun. Of course, I said. I'm from the machine gun company. Then you'll go on my plane as a gunner on board. It was my salvation from Stalingrad. The Ju-52 took off, and we safely made it out of the encirclement. My war was over there. I believe it is necessary to pay honor to the veterans of the Battle of Stalingrad in Germany, as they deserve it. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please support it by giving it a like. Bye, everyone. See you later.